Luis Raimondo. And as you can see, I'm squinting. It is an exceptional sunny day in East Hampton, New York. And um, I'm the education coordinator at the Paula Krasna House and Study Center in East Hampton, 100 miles east of New York City on Long Island. Behind me is the now famous barn where Pollock and Krasna made their abstract expressionist paintings. And you can come visit starting in May, you can come in person and um, enjoy the beautiful property. They purchased the property in 1946. And we have a beautiful water view overlooking Akabonic Creek that goes all the way out to the end of Long Island. And um, you can also explore the now, um, you know, the historic house. And we're gonna have a special exhibition in May called Creative Exchanges. And we are going to um, show the artists who were in Lee Krasner's address book. So that's gonna be a lot of fun. If you can't come in person, you can go to pkhouse.org and come to all of our virtual programs for free. So today we have a very special program. Um, it's called Art Access, and we have two wonderful guests from the Museum of Modern Art, and they are going to uh, show us how uh, they introduce art to people with, uh, who are blind or have very low vision in varying degrees. And um, they're well known really worldwide for their innovative programs. And um, so I'm so happy to introduce our guest speakers. And hold on one moment, please. I'm gonna spotlight them. And let me just find uh, Francesca Rosenberg and Annie uh, Least. And um, I would like to say it's a little extra special for me today because Francesca Rosenberg and I worked together in the 1990s and at the Museum of Modern Art, where I worked for eight years as the family programs coordinator. And so Francesca has long been a leader in the field. And um, she is today the director of access programs and initiatives. And Annie uh, Leist, or Leist, you could uh, correct me, Annie, is associate educator in access programs and initiatives. And um, they're both from the Museum of Modern Arts Learning and Engagement Department. And they will inform uh, audiences who are blind or have low vision of the many available resources and share program methodology, excuse me, methodologies with museum educators and other professionals to make art available for all. So on that note, everybody, let's give uh, them a big Zoom welcome. <laughs> and I'm going to turn it over to Francesca. Thank you, Joyce. Um, hello, everybody. It is such a pleasure to have this hour together with you. Um, and thank you, Joyce, so much for inviting us to, um, to speak about welcoming visitors who are blind or have low vision to, uh, to MoMA. And um, if you go to the next slide, you'll see what Joyce was just speaking about, which is uh, the two of us back in the day. Um, this is sometime kind of mid late 90s. And um, I'll do like a little verbal description of the image then and of my image now. Um, <laughs> So Joyce looks exactly the same with uh, long brown hair and beautiful brown eyes. And she is in a power suit, which um, is kind of gray with a black camisole underneath. Um, and we are posed together, um, smiling at the camera. She's on the right, on your right side. I'm on the left and I'm also in some sort of a power suit um, that you can see from the kind of waist up. Um, maybe it's black or very dark brown with kind of a white uh, camisole underneath. And I have um, in this picture, very long brown hair that's kind of pulled back um, at the, um, I don't know, at the nape of my neck. And I have glasses on that are maroon and I have green eyes. And today 
I um, also have glasses on uh, that are brown and um, I have a green top on. I'm, I was then a, a white woman and I still am. And, uh, <laughs> and the biggest change for me is that I um, have blonde hair now. Of course, it's completely natural, uh, and I'm wearing a green um, a green top, and I'm in a very green room. Um, and so we like to kind of give uh, just descriptions in case you know anyone um, has low vision um, and may not be able to to see th these images. Um, also, people may be calling in by phone, so. That um, was a quick verbal description, but again, um, it's so nice to be together with Joyce again after so many years. So uh, next slide, please. And Annie will now introduce herself. Hi, everybody. My name is Annie Least. You got it right, Joyce. So um, uh, last and least, I don't know. Um, and I am a white middle-aged woman with sort of curly red hair. It's pretty short and so you can't see much of it today because it's pulled back by my signature bright yellow uh, over the ear headphones and I'm wearing a red sweater over a black top. And uh, I am coming to you from my, uh, the MoMA branch in my apartment in Queens, New York. Um, where and in my background is pretty blurred, but um, that's largely because I don't typically invite total strangers into my bedroom. Um, so it, you can see sort of blurred taupe and blue colors um, because I'm a fan of the beach. So um, that's what I find relaxing. Um, and I have the privilege of working with Francesca at MoMA. I am, have been working there. I'm on my fourth year. Uh, I guess I, I've been there just over three years um, and I can't believe it. It's been sort of a whirlwind. Um, and I uh, also work on programs uh, and initiatives for folks who uh, who have disabilities. Um, that's our team, the access programs and initiatives team in MoMA's learning and engagement department. Um, and a lot of what I do is working with folks who are blind or have low vision. Um, a part of that is because I'm also a member of that group. I identify as someone who has very low vision. Um, and so the image that I'm showing you actually is, is uh, an image of myself participating in a performance that uh, performance aspect of an installation that was done by the artist Amanda Williams in MoMA's atrium a couple years ago. Um, and Amanda basically stacked up lots of furniture that wasn't being used because during the pandemic, MoMA, even after it had opened to the public, had reduced some of the some of the sort of seating opportunities to create more space. So there were a lot of our seats that were typically in gallery spaces that were not being used. So um, Amanda Williams piled them all up in one place and made sort of an installation, started thinking about um, museum access in a very broad way, not just thinking about disability, but other forms of accessibility to museums and other sort of cultural information, um, both physically and um, electronically and conceptually. And part of these performances was um, where there were some instructions, a series of instructions uh, projected on very large screens on the wall and uh, folks could sign up to actually participate in this installation by following these instructions. So that's a very sort of long way to tell you what's going on in this picture. You can see um, it's in a big space with a very high ceiling. Um, you can see some dark benches and other types of furniture piled on the floor sort of to the left. Above those is a screen that has a series of instructions that is involves thinking of something very funny and moving through the space backwards while laughing. Um, and then at the very bottom right, you can see me um, as a uh, I'm I'm as a sort of person wearing I'm wearing a little yellow dress and white sneakers and a white sweater, and I'm using my white cane, which I typically use when traveling um, to assist in navigation as somebody who has low vision. But if you sort of think about the posture that I have, the cane is actually behind me, so. Although you cannot see the movement in this image, um, you could guess that I am actually walking backwards with my cane, um, which if you're used to walking forwards with a cane and navigating through touch, walking backwards is a piece of cake. So um, 
I just sort of, one of the things that I think is really interesting, um, one of the reasons I got into this field is that I'm an artist. I had the fortune, the great fortune of being um, exposed to art and encouraged to draw and create art um, from the time I was very, very young, um, no matter what my level of vision was, I've always had low vision, um, but it was not considered counterintuitive for um, my parents and my teachers, you know, to um, allow me to, or encourage me to participate in visual art. So I was drawing from a young age, I was being taken to museums from a very young age. And as I grew older, I realized that a lot of people who are blind or have low vision have not had that same encouragement or opportunity. And it just sort of used to make me crazy when I would think, when I would hear people say, um, hear other blind folks say things like, there's there's nothing for me at an art museum, or I can't get anything out of that. Um, or maybe I used to go when I had vision, but now that I've lost my vision, I'm not going to go. And so that's part of why um, I do the work that I do. And that's part of why we are here today. So I'm going to pass it on back to Francesca. Thanks, Annie. And um... You know, one of the greatest predictors of whether art is going to be a part of your life is whether you're introduced to it when you're young. And so that is something that we're really committed to at MoMA is to making sure that people young um, and old and everybody in between um, has, you know, full access to the museum and all that it has to offer. And we think about um, all different visitors today were specifically focusing on people who are blind or have low vision. Um, the image that you're seeing right now is the entrance to the museum. And um, this is the main entrance on 53rd Street um, between 5th and 6th Avenues. And I know that there are people that are joining us from all over the world. And, um, you know, it's this is Midtown Manhattan. It looks relatively calm in this image. There aren't too many people, but um, you can be sure that um, if you're visiting on a on a more average day, um, you can expect to see lots and lots of crowds around. Uh, the museum has gotten back to being really a bustling, very vibrant place, and um, and so I I encourage all of you to come and visit. And um, if you haven't been in a while, um, please do come back as well. Um, so the next slide, please. Um, so the moment has actually a really long history of thinking about people with disabilities. Um, and in fact, from 1944 to 1948, MoMA offered free art classes uh, to people who served in World War II. Um, through an initiative that was called the War Veterans Art Center. And what you see on the screen right now is a flyer for that um, advertising, that offering. Um, the project was run by Victor D'Amico, who served as the museum's first director of education and um, who also actually has a long history out by um, the Pollock Krasner House because he, um, he started the Art Barge. So for any of you um, local folks from um, Long Island out near Amagansett, um, that's where the art barge is. And, and Victor D'Amico ran that for many, many years. Uh, and he and his colleagues through the War Veterans Art Center explored the role of creative engagement in facilitating the transition from military service to civilian life and offered as it says in this um, image, you know, drawing and painting and sculpture and pottery and graphic arts and layout, woodwork and jewelry and metalwork and model making and weaving. Um, and today we continue in this same spirit, building upon this type of experimentation and civil service. We think about art and how it can be used by various audiences um, to enhance their lives and also to ensure that they feel seen valued and heard. Next slide, please. And one of the oldest programs that we've had at MoMA um, ongoing since 1972 is the Touch Tour. And so in fact, we are celebrating um, over 50 years of Touch Tours 
at MoMA. Um, and these black and white images show uh, visitors engaged in touch tours. The one on the left um, shows a, uh, a, a woman named Mary West with her guide dog touching a David Smith metal sculpture. Behind her is the guide, Richard Barr, who um, Joyce, you may remember Richard. He was a, a lovely, wonderful um, human who um, helped to run our volunteer program at MoMA in the, the 90s and even before that, I believe. Um, and then the image on the right actually shows uh, a, a much younger me uh, <laughs> giving a touch tour to a visitor. I don't know her name, um, but uh, she also has a guide dog and we're out in MoMA's sculpture garden um, touching also a, a David Smith metal uh, sculpture that's on the right. We're wearing gloves. And um, that's how we do the touch tour still. We, um, we ask visitors to wear uh, gloves. These gloves um, we provide and they let through the temperature and the texture of the works of art. And um, it really feels like direct touch. Uh, we have many, many works that have uh, received the permission uh, from the curatorial and conservation departments. And um, these are works all original by artists like Picasso, Matisse, Rodin. Um, we have uh, mostly bronze works to touch, but there are some exceptions to that as well. And I think the next slide shows a more recent image. Yes, this is Annie giving a touch tour um, to one of our um, one of our visitors, Abby, and um, Abby's also been kind of a, a bit of an advisor to us. And so um, there they are touching the Matisse heads. Uh, these are five heads of a woman made of bronze, and they um, they start out quite realistic. These busts. And then they um, they get more and more abstract. And um, these these uh, touch tours are by appointment, um, either for one on one or for small small groups to come. And um, we also make them available to school groups of students who are blind or have low vision through um, the. Department of Education and uh, District 75. And um, it's always a great pleasure to, <laughs> to leave these programs because you know we're getting to do what all visitors want to do but aren't allowed to do. And um, it's just incredible to notice things with your hands that really your eyes um, just glance over and may not, um, may not see at all. So, um, so those are our touch tours. And um, the next slide, yep, yeah, shows, um, shows another kind of a program that we also have offered for a long time. This is um, an art insight program. And um, that program includes detailed verbal description of works of art. And um, in this case, we're talking here in this slide about Monet's water lilies. And um, these descriptions are essentially painting a picture in the mind's eye. Um, these works obviously can't be touched. They're paintings. Um, we include you know, other two-dimensional works of art, um, uh, prints, photographs, drawings, and so on. Um, and you know, we started this program also, you know, I said 20, 20 years ago, um, because what became through
Uh, Frances, on my end, I can't hear anything. Is anybody else having a problem? I can't hear anything either. This is frozen. Okay, we lost Francesca. So we'll wait. Think we we'll shut wait. down Everything. and open again. No, just wait. Sometimes there's a glitch and the person comes back on. Okay. Okay, but you can hear me. Annie, can you speak so we could just yep. see? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, so there's something. Oh, good. Francesca's end. Okay, and I'm sure she will um, leave and come back. Yeah. Um, and then we can um, welcome her back. But in the meantime, I'm happy to sort of pick up where she left off, if that's okay. Of course. Um, sure. Um, and I, as I said, I know she will come back as soon as she can. <laughs> um, so um, as she was saying in this image, um, we're sort of showing... And, and in the touch tour images, we were sort of showing you um, programs that people have been interested in participating in. Um, and there's there's one more that I wanted that we wanted to share with you also, um, because we have been also working forming partnerships with um, with living artists. Um, we've realized that that's something that um, is actually a really fabulous way to make connections and make artwork more accessible is if we engage the living artists who show work in our museum. Obviously not every artist who has work in MoMA um, is still around for us to work with, but those that are often really wonderful when we sort of share with them the um, importance of making their work, especially sort of custom inst installed or site specific work accessible to the broadest audience possible. Um, a lot of artists get very excited about this and um, we often get to work with very interesting people. This is an image of a performance by Walid Rad, that's R-A-A-D. Um, the reason we included it is um, Walid is one of the artists that we worked with in addition to others, including Guadalupe Maravilla or um, <clears throat> Park, Park MacArthur, um, who are artists that really sort of connected with a lot of the audiences that we work with, but in particular, the blind and low vision audience. Um, Walid Rod uh, helped in, in, in sort of when we did, when, we, when this was before my time, but when my uh, counterpart uh, was preparing a program for folks who are blind or have low vision, um, the artist was actually very interested in not only sort of being a guest speaker, but actually participating in that program by um, creating and delivering his own descriptions of his work. Um, so those descriptions were then colored by the artist's intent and experience and, and sort of special knowledge of what was important in the work, which is a really wonderful direct way for folks to learn. But um, as Francesco was beginning to say, um, programs are not the only way that folks like to participate. Um, are, I'm, are in, I'm, I'm are back. You, are you I, back? Yeah, Beautiful. I'm so sorry. I, that has never happened um, to me before. I just disappeared. But um, thank you for, it's a good thing that you and I work very closely. So I'm sure it was a seamless transition. Um, and I guess, yeah, I would just um, add that we we love working with um, with living artists like Wally Broad. We also did um, an art insight program with Park MacArthur. Um, we did one with Guadalupe Maravilla most recently, and um, and these are always, I think, you know, a wonderful experience both for the artists themselves, um, but also, of course, for the um, you know, the attendees of these programs that get to hear directly from, from these, these very important artists. Um, and so Annie was, was starting to talk about the independent visitor and that's what we're showing in this slide, which um, is a woman who, um, who's using a wheelchair, who is being um, pushed by a, a woman who is standing behind her and they're both, um, looking at a Brancusi sculpture in one of the museum's galleries. And um, so the idea of this slide is really to signal to you that, you know, while yes, you know, we love um, offering all the programs that we do, 
um, most often visitors are coming to, you know, blind and, and partially sighted visitors are coming to the museum either on their own or with friends or family members. And, um, and so that means that we really have to think across the institution about how to ensure that all the places um, that they go and all the people that they interact with feel, um, feel accessible to them. And so, um, you know, we work across the museum to ensure that all the building spaces, including, you know, the cafe, the store, um, the galleries are accessible to all. And um, we work, we, we offer DET, which is disability equality trainings to both the front of house staff as well as um, the curators and exhibition designers. And, um, and these trainings are made up of um, awareness and empathy building. And through them, we're talking um, not just about people who are blind or have low vision, but, but all you know, visitors with different disabilities, thinking about, for instance, people with Alzheimer's disease, people on the autism spectrum, individuals who are deaf, just to name a few. Um, the other part of the training is more nuts and bolts, where we're talking about what makes an exhi exhibition accessible. So for instance, we talk about the font size of the wall labels. Um, is there accessible seating in the galleries? Um, is there gonna be the use of a sound amplification device uh, for someone who may have hearing loss and so on? So um, really the independent visitor is always on our minds. Um, so now I'm gonna turn things back over to Annie to talk more about the kinds of um, resources and other offerings that we have for the independent visitor. Sure, thanks Francesca. Um, and so just to sort of summarize what we've talked about already, we've talked about our long history of working with folks with disabilities, trying to make our museum as welcoming as possible for um, disabled visitors. We talked about um, the touch tours that we've been doing for over 50 years. We've talked about Art Insight, which is a program that is much more description based and now exists both um, virtually and um, with occasional uh, in-person programming um, that will include description and also multi-sensory engagement as well. Um, but, uh, and we've talked about special programming with, uh, in partnership with audience, with artists. But as Francesca has said, the independent visitor is really the vast majority of, of um, how folks with disabilities encounter our museum. And so in addition to working closely with our colleagues in a number of different departments to try to make the museum space itself and every new exhibition that we install as accessible as possible, as well as our cafes and our shops and our bathrooms, um, the full experience, um, we're also trying to sort of increase resources that folks can navigate on their own. So one project that we have um, sort of uh, that was started several years ago and has just been refreshed, I would say, in the past year, is a project that involves creating recorded audio descriptions um, that folks can access either on MoMA's website or um, through the Bloomberg app, which I'll show you uh, an image of in a minute. Um, so right now I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to invite Joyce to navigate to the website and uh, so that we can listen to at least one of these descriptions together. So here Thanks. I go. I'm stopping. Any second now. There we go. Great. And as Joyce is navigating, um, I want to sort of invite you all once we get to play the description to kind of listen in your mind, um, close your eyes if that makes sense for you, um, if that makes a difference for you um, and kind of um, sort of as you're listening to the description that we will play in a minute, um, you can sort of really get a sense of trying to sort of form that mental image in your head without looking at something. So Joyce went to the website moma.org slash audio slash descriptions. And Francesca, I think you can, you were gonna paste that in the chat for folks if they want to have access to this website um, after this program. Um, but 
Uh, you can also, if you can't remember moma.org slash audio slash descriptions, if you go to moma.org slash audio, you'll find the verbal description tour. And Joyce is scrolling down and you can see that currently we have about I would say about 25 descriptions available. These are all works that are on view. We have a few other descriptions that have been recorded um, that are not currently shown on the website simply because their objects are not on view in the museum itself. Um, but we do have um, description of both a uh, Jackson Pollock and a Lee Krasner. So Joyce, actually what I'm gonna invite you to do in a second is to um, click, or well, actually go ahead and do this. You can click on the Lee Krasner Gaia painting. Um, and what we have here is a, a screen that is black with the image in color on the top half um, in white text. We see the title and the, uh, the artist and the title and the date. And on down the left, we get to see sort of the other, what we call the tombstone information, which is things like the medium and the date and who donated it and that sort of things. And on the right hand side, we actually see a transcript of what we're about to hear. Um, so um, what we will hear is about three and a half minutes of um, both a description and then a little um, a little bonus track with the artist herself speaking about the work. So, um, Joyce, if you'd like to press play. The artist Lee Krasner made Gaia in 1966 using oil paint on canvas. The work measures five feet nine inches high and ten feet six inches wide. In metric units, it is about 175 centimeters high and 319 centimeters wide. This canvas is covered from edge to edge with an abstract composition in lipstick pink, dark purple, and creamy white with hints of peach. It is one of several large horizontal paintings that Krasner made in the 1960s, this one the size of a storefront window. We can imagine the physical gestures required for the artist to apply such forceful, sweeping strokes of paint to the canvas. Several broad, roughly rendered forms define the composition. Though abstract, they might evoke eggs, flowers, or flower petals, upside-down teardrops, clouds, cells, or other forms from nature. The largest of these forms takes up the lower left quarter of the canvas and is nearly double the size of the others. It is mostly cream colored with swooping pink streaks defining its bottom half. Two forms hover above the largest oval. The one on the left is primarily cream colored with a curved pink stroke encircling most of it. To its right, a white kite shaped form is marked by a pink almond shape at the center surrounded by curved pink brush strokes that suggest looking at the inside of a rose. As we move across the painting, more rounded forms jostle to fill the canvas, some less than a foot across. The shapes appear to move and dance, crowding, overlapping, and bumping into each other. Several of the somersaulting shapes are pink and marked with thick bands of cream that define their curved edges. The space between the forms is a connective tissue of loosely applied purple paint, ranging from plum to a deep wine color. Percussive splatters of dark purple and white paint pepper the painting, indicating places where the artist may have hit the brush against the canvas. Krasner rejected the notion that her paintings were devoid of content. She said she wouldn't dream of creating a painting from a fully abstract idea. Titled Gaia, after the ancient Greek goddess of the earth, the painting's vivid colors, organic shapes, and fluid movement reflect the artist's fascination with the natural world and its origins. Let's learn more about this work from the artist. I think my initial contact with the canvas, because some gesture occurs, some yes. sweep across yes. the canvas before I take off, so to speak, yes. and in that initial contact may be a suggestion which dictates then mm -hmm. color. Your second or third attack on the canvas may suggest or even look beautiful, but you feel a need to carry it further. Well, pretty soon you're in this combat with the canvas. Mm. I like a canvas to breathe and be alive. Be alive is the point. Mm. And as your limitations are something called pigment and canvas, let's see if I can do it.
Thank you, Joyce, for playing that. Um, and before we go back to the PowerPoint, I just want to offer the opportunity for folks um, who may be new to listening to descriptions to take a minute and share in the chat um, at what that was like for you. Um, how was that different? Um, may, or maybe you've heard a lot of descriptions and, and you can sort of share what uh, maybe what benefits you got from that or what questions it made arise for you. If anyone has any thoughts, please feel free to enter them in the chat while Joyce and I are switching back. Um, any thoughts on that? And it's okay if not. Well, I always have a thought. <laughs> Joyce, I can say something. Good, go ahead. Hi, um, I, you know, I close my eyes to listen to it. I'm familiar with the work. I've seen it. I'm curious to know if someone's never seen color before, how do you describe color? I mean, even if you say peach or white or how was that received? That's a great question. Um, and and th this is Annie speaking. I can I can take that in Francesca if you want to augment what I say. But um, you know these descriptions were actually part of our process was definitely involving a group a group of folks of advisors who are blind or have low vision. Um, I'm also uh, somebody with low vision. Um, many folks who have vision loss are still able to make out certain aspects of of the visual world, whether that be color or light. Um, but in addition to that, even if you're working with folks who have no vision at all and have never seen color, color has cultural connotations. Um, so it is not that folks have lived in a world without color, they've just experienced color through language and literature and music and other folks description or knowing what an object is and understanding that uh, this apple is red and this apple is this thing called green and, and um, grass is this other thing called green. Um, so the other thing that we try to think about when we're working color into descriptions, and this is particularly important in abstract art, um, but is thinking about what the color is doing. Is it vibrating? Is it blending? Is it evoking a certain temperature? Um, is it evoking a certain um, sort of is it, is it strong or is it drawing the eye or is it repelling the eye? What is it doing? Um, just like a shape or a movement in the painting, color is taking an action in an artwork. So if we left it out, we would be leaving out something that's fundamentally um, essential to describing the work. Um, and I open that up also to Francesca or to anybody else who is in the audience that has low vision or is blind that wants to speak about color. Hello, my name is Kat. Um, as a blind person, uh, color, what little sight I have, what I perceive as being a pink, mm -hmm. others keep telling me it's more of a red. Mm -hmm. So it's hard for me to picture the colors that they're telling me when my eyes are seeing something different. Mm -hmm. um, I also deal with a lot of totally blind adults and when I'm trying to do colors with them, I try to do it in whether it's a warm color or cold. Mm -hmm. They seem to find that better uh, than just trying to tell them it's a dark red. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Kat. Yeah, I think that's a really important um, characteristic of color. It's Francesca. Thank you, Kat. And yeah, I, I would just you know echo what, um, what Annie was saying about, you know, that, that people have their own associations to, uh, to color and that it's, you know, it's very important to not leave out the color um, when you're describing a work of art. Um, and Michael wrote in the chat that he's um, a legally blind person with considerable use of residual vision. Um, he says, I do see color well and have always loved modern art. I see groups of living beings in this painting. 
but I must compliment your description in that you describe what is there and leave the interpretation to the individual. And I thank you so much, Michael, for sharing that because that's also, you know, a very important uh, aspect of these uh, of these descriptions is um, not to be subjective, but to be um, to be as as objective as possible when um, when providing these um, these descriptions. So really, to say um, very, you know, just give a straightforward description of what is visible, but to leave the interpretation to the, the, you know, the participant, the person who's in, in front of the work, the attendee to the program, the visitor to the museum. Um, so just to provide enough information so that then that person can come up with their own conclusions about what they think um, the work is about. Mm -hmm. Any other sort of comments or thoughts? Uh, Tom Babcock has his hand raised. Mm. Hello. Hi. Oh, great. Um, I'm Tom Babcock. I'm uh, in Orlando, Florida. And I am the first vice president of the Greater Orlando Council of the Blind. Oh. Um, I like the app. I have... Uh, lost my sight later in life so I know color I mean I remember color let's hope uh, I do like the app where it gives you a little audio description of what you're looking at and the colors um, I have joined a group here in Orlando called the Florida Sculpture Guild and uh, it's just all sculptures and we did a show well, I got invited to help them with the show. Uh, it started out with 25 sculptures, but what they did, they didn't do any audio description at the time, but what they did, they put two big square tiles in front of each sculpture with, if you're blind and visually impaired, you know what bump dots, bump dots are, mm -hmm. like bumpy. And once you feel it with your feet, you could reach out and touch the sculpture. Um, Basically, it was for uh, to feel it, to touch it, to be creative, to get fascinated, to figure out what it was. And out of twenty-five of them, I think I got twelve right. Yeah. But with and it was and it was just really a lot of fun. But it brought me back into the well, brought me into the art world. And now I've learned what you know different materials are used, what different you know, and how to when you touch them, how to figure them out and what happened. It's, and it's a program called uh, Revision. Hmm. If you could go to uh, fsg.org and go to Revision, it will explain what our show is. And we've been uh, doing a few other shows. And we also uh, offered sighted people to come in and go through and then go through again blindfolded. And they got a whole different perspective. Some people uh, did not like the blindfold at all. They did they just for a few minutes and they, they couldn't deal it. Other people went through the whole uh, show again and came back and said, wow, they have a different perspective of what blind and visually impaired people go through. It was quite interesting. You know, mostly it was very positive, um, but it was just a very interesting show. And we've done a few others and a few workshops. Uh, we did one with the uh, uh, 12 children from Lighthouse of Central Florida School for the Blind. And these kids were amazing. They inspired me. Because they, I mean, they, their sculptures came out just like beautiful and animals and different things. And they had fun. And it was all done in air clay, air dried clay. Mm -hmm. And uh it was just fascinating, but it brought me really into the art world again. And I, like I said, I do like the app where you can tap on it because blind people tap on everything. You know, tap twice on your iPhone, tap twice on this. Um, and you get some kind of audio description of what you're looking at or, you know, and what you're touching or, you know, but the sculptures really uh, brought out the creativity and the fascination for art and uh uh, it was 
quite interesting. But uh, thank you. Thank you for having me on. Thank you for sharing all of that. Really appreciate knowing what else is going on. You know, it's it's uh, there are a lot of different opportunities in New York for folks uh -huh. who are blind or have low vision to explore museums and the art world in lots of different ways. And it's great to know that that's not um, that 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 sort of work is happening outside, you know, in other places yeah. as well. Yeah. So thank you for letting one, us know. One exciting thing is that we're uh, we're moving the show to Miami next year at the oh, cool. Basel Museum. Mm. And uh, it should be fun. We just got to figure out how to get there. <laughs> I and said I, I could I could hold a I could hold a sculpture <laughs> on the train. <laughs> I think things like this are becoming more. I, I think this is also sort of a kind of this is Annie speaking again. I think this is sort of a um, another consequence, a little bit of the pandemic when a lot of things became more um, online, like this. That we're exactly. having this conversation with folks from all over the place, um, and that aspect of it is, is not of it is not going away. So there are now a lot of shared resources. There are a lot of um, groups of people who are connecting and folks are becoming much more of a, aware of um, the audience of people who are blind or have low vision um, and how sort of powerful a group it is. I mean, we, in celebration of our over 50th anniversary of, of um, touch tours at MoMA, we had sort of a day long open house program and we had, and again, we've been doing this for over 50 years, and we had many, many people who had never realized that this sort of thing was available at our museum, who had never been to our museum or had not been in many years. And we had opportunities for folks to touch sculpture. We had some art making for adults and for kids. Um, we had verbal description tours, and we showed a screening of um, the Guillermo del Toro version of Pinocchio that had both open captioning and open description. So everyone in the movie theater could see the captions and hear the, the description. So everyone was having this shared experience, um, which is kind of what I'm getting at that you brought up, um, that, that, you know, it's interesting for um, for everyone to be able to share some of these communal experiences. We always invite um, our blind visitors to bring their guests, to bring their friends and family along to touch tours um, so that they can touch the sculptures as well. And we don't typically use blindfolds, but it's interesting still to offer that shared experience. Um, any last kind of thoughts about description before I just wrap up um, in terms of talking about other things that we're doing. Annie, would you mind stopping the screen share just so we could see your lovely presence and uh, Uh Sure. Did you want me to finish the, just wrap up the slides first or? Oh, oh, you have more slides. Yeah, just a couple oh, more. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was just, I was just cl closing down this section of the program. If anybody had anything else they wanted to share about the description that they heard and just a couple more, I just wanted to share, um, an app was mentioned and there are a lot of different apps out there. And a lot of folks who are blind or have low vision do use their phones. Um, smartphones, uh, have been very revolutionary for this group. Um, so we've also included our visual description tour on, um, a new platform that MoMA is now a part of. The app is the Bloomberg Connects app. That's B-L-O-O-M-B-E-R-G. And then the second word is connects, C-O-N-N-E-C-T-S. And this is a platform that has a lot of different museums um, and cultural institutions that share their audio uh, in particular and some video on this app. Um, and MoMA has several sort of audio involving curators or, or um, conservators or other folks talk artists talking about the artwork but we do also have our visual description tour that's available and we're hoping that it's only going to grow um this is an image of one of our blind visitors um standing in front of the monet water lilies um using his phone um to listen to the description that um is is on this app so it's something that can be done in the museum but it's also something that you all can um if you download the bloomberg connects app which is free and then you search for m o m a you will find our um our sort of set uh, our special sort of section of the Bloomberg app and then you can find all kinds of audio including the verbal descriptions 
Um, and just one last thing that I think Francesca wanted to share about in terms of resources for folks who might be sort of maybe not receiving this work as visitors, but who are interested in implementing some of it. Right, thanks. So this um, this slide is a, the a photo of the cover of a brand new book um, called Interactive Museum Tours, a guide to in-person and virtual experiences. And um, it's a colleague of, of our Sharon Vatsky who's put this together. Joyce and, and Sharon also go way back um, to the Queens Museum, I believe. And, um, and so Sharon has invited a number of different authors to, um, to write chapters in the book and it's related to the topic today because there's actually a chapter um, by Karen Bergman of the Guggenheim Museum um, talking specifically about how to make interactive museum tours for people who are blind or have low vision. Um, there's other chapters that include um, topics such as social and emotional learning in museums. Um, there's uh, a, a developing programming and offerings for people um, on the autism spectrum. And, um, and it's, like I said, a, a brand new book. I haven't, um, I haven't gotten to even flip through it myself <laughs> because it's on, it's in the mail on the way to me. Um, but I um, want to encourage anyone who might be interested in it to, to get their hands on it. And in fact, um, I'm gonna put in the chat a code um, that you can use to order it at 30% off. It's, um, it's the publisher is Roman and Littlefield. And I can put, um, put those details in the chat. I also wanted to mention um, in terms of resources that we um, we were talking earlier about um, about disability equality training, and in fact, my team and I um, have worked for many years developing sort of tools, videos, and um, other resources that we use at MoMA to um, to train. As I said earlier, you know, frontline staff, but also the curators and exhibition planners and designers and so on. And so these all of these resources are available on our website for anyone to use. Um, we know that people, um, colleagues from you know cultural institutions all over the world, um, have looked into um, this and and have used some. Um, They've also developed their own um, tools for this kind of training, which is wonderful. And we all, you know, learn from each other um, and are very open, open to sharing. So anyway, I'm going to put all of this um, in the chat in case, um, in case you're interested. We also are, are very happy um, to, after this Zoom, be in touch uh, and Annie has just put up our last slide, which is access programs at moma.org is where both Annie and I can receive any, um, any further questions or um, any thoughts. Yep, or if you'd like to uh, be added to, if you're a first, uh, uh, if you're a person who would like to be added to our mailing list for programming for folks who are blind or have low vision, we do still do a lot of virtual programming. So even if you're not in the New York area, or if you're in the New York area, or you're coming to visit and you want to check out the museum in person, or request a an individual or small group touch and description tour of a, a, a gallery or exhibition or subject of your choice, um, this is how you would do it right now. It's access programs, all one word, um, A double C E double S P R O G R A M S at MOMA.org, M O M A dot O R G. We would love to meet you. And I will stop sharing the screen now. Oh, Annie, I didn't mean to rush you at all. Oh no, that's okay. That was that was amazing. And I know everyone learned so much. And I know it's gonna be, you know, like they say you throw a stone in, in water and it reverberates outwards. That's what I feel this talk has done. Um, so before we close, 
I would like to make a few announcements actually. Um, one is somebody was asking, will this be recorded? Of course. Thank you. And um, I would like to let people know that uh, this program was part of a series, which was to serve uh, people with, who are blind um, or have low vision. And if you'd like, you can go to the YouTube channel and it's, I'm just going to send it right now. Um, I have a video on there called Physical Challenges, Creative Opportunities. And in that video, it's, the, it's a broader topic, but a subtopic is how artists such as Monet and Degas um, actually, uh, their creativity transformed as a result of their eye issues. And it's just fascinating how creative artists are. They don't just adapt, they actually use that for creative genius. Mm -hmm. um, and also the Pollock Krasner House and Study Center, we offer descriptive tours of our site to libraries, to any institution. You can contact me, Joyce at imagineartad.com. And I'll put it in the chat. You can go to uh, pkhouse.org for all the contact info. And I'll set that up at your convenience. And any last minute questions or comments? Oh, I have one. Mm -hmm. Do you hear um, Bill Maloney? Mm -hmm. I, yes, Bill, go I, ahead. Oh, thank you. I was trying to get in earlier, but I couldn't unmute. But I, I, I'm aware of both of those paintings. I've been in the Pollock Krasner house and I've been to MoMA also. I, I thought uh, if you could describe the overall uh, vividness of the colors, like is it a over, because I, I can't see any other colors at all, but is like, like I'm aware the water lilies is a subdued painting from seeing it before, but in the Pollock Krasner house, is that like a profound feeling colors? Cause I don't remember the colors of that. So is it a very vivid feeling painting or is it a more calm? So I was interested in if it could have been related that way, but I really appreciate this uh, program today. Thank you. Anyone? Uh, this, this uh, is, I think the, the this shapes is... are more profound, far more <laughs> profound than Monet's work. Not as much, uh, well, maybe more contrasty also in color, but definitely the shapes are far more profound mm -hmm. than Monet's work. Oh, yes, but I was just saying, would you describe the colors as very bold? Francesca or Annie, can you add to that? Specifically, you're talking about the um, the Krasner one that we played or the yeah. Pollock? The Krasner. Yes, yes. I would say the Krasner colors are um, are intense and yeah, very okay. bold. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I think we called the the pink sort of like a lipstick right right bubblegum yeah. pink yeah, yeah, yeah. um and the there's like a deep purple um that runs throughout um so i would say they're very yes very intense bold colors ah, thank, yeah that's what i was curious yeah, thanks very much everybody we're going to have to close now and um i really Honestly, I can't even tell you thank you enough how much I know myself and everyone appreciates you taking the time to do this presentation and share your amazing expertise and the history of the Museum of Modern Art and all the great work that you're doing to ensure that the museum and art is accessible to all people. And I just love it. Like my heart is so, uh, so happy right now to see good works by good people and modern art. You know, I love modern art, so it's all good. So let's give these wonderful speakers a Zoom round of applause if you want to unmute and do a little clap, so. Oh, thank you. Aww. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks to all of you. Thank you, Joyce, for the opportunity. It was so nice to connect with all of you. Can I, can I ask one more question? Sure. Real quick? 
Of course. Um, this is Tom in Orlando. The Bloomberg Connect app mm -hmm. can uh, can you can anybody subscribe or get into it? Is yes. with their own yes. program? Yeah, you just it's, go it's to the app store and you uh -huh. download download the Bloomberg app. It's it's for iPhone or Android. Um, okay. And okay. I, I think I'm hearing a little bit of a screen reader in your background, Tom. I can't swear to that, but it um, it, it does. If you're an iPhone user, it does yes. is pretty compatible with Voiceover, the screen reader. Okay, um, gotcha. That makes sense. That makes and, sense. Yeah, and and it, Bloomberg Connects is a platform that has a lot of different museums on it. So what you will have to do whenever you open it up is type in MoMA in order to get access okay. to our content. Um, but it okay. is it is totally free. Um, and then if if that's too much effort and if you're just sitting on your computer again, you can, for our descriptions, you can always go to moma.org slash audio slash descriptions. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. I have one more comment about what we did at the uh, sculpture show is that I did a, a week's worth of mobility training for all the... Mm people that were working in the museum or, or uh, the people with blindfolds that need, they needed help and they were amazed how how we can do that, how we get around. But thank you so much. I Great information and oh my God, I'm just excited now. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you, Tom. Thanks, Tom. And thank if you. I could just throw in, the, I, without trying, got uh, on my phone one day it's Art UK and it's representative by Bloomberg. I don't know if it's the same program that you're on, but anyone who's into art, I, I would recommend it. They give like half hour lectures mm -hmm. weekly. It's Art UK represented okay. by Bloomberg. Thank you. Right. Okay, everybody. Um, we're gonna have to close off because I do have another appointment. And wherever you are, have a wonderful day or you evening. Too. And thank you again to Annie and Francesca and the Museum of Modern Art. Well, come down to Florida and check, check out Revision. Great, excellent. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks, Joyce. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.